Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India We had looked at uh, all the air breathing systems. Now let us take a look at what are the non air breathing systems. Okay. Why do you think we need this? I thought uh, we had covered a large Mach number range with the air breathing system itself. Why do we think? Why do you think we need the non-air breathing system? Okay, that is one part of the reason. Yes. For travel beyond. sensible atmosphere. Uh, the other reason that it exists is suppose you need a large thrust for a very short duration even within the atmosphere then you tend to go in for non air breathing propulsion okay. because if you look at air breathing propulsion uh, other than the ramjet engine most others are very bulky right. So if you are looking for a large thrust for a very short time you cannot uh, use a large dead weight to propel the system okay. if you are looking at a turbo jet engine to propel it if you are looking for a large thrust for a short time then you cannot use it and then discard it right. Therefore we tend to go in for rockets or non air breathing propulsion even within the sensible atmosphere typically missiles tend to make use of this. Remember I said uh, any of the ramjet engines are not self starting and they need to be taken to a, the Mach number range beyond 1 for them to be operational. Usually a uh, rocket engine is used to take it to that because uh, you can get to that very quickly right if you use a rocket engine. Now most of these uh, uh, air ramjet engines are used either as an interceptor missile right then you are looking at a very short response time that you have once the enemy is intruded into your territory, territory you want to uh, find out how to go about neutralizing the enemy right it it has a very short time you have a very short response time that is available to you so if you have to respond within that time then you need a rocket engine and then a ramjet engine okay okay uh, now in non air breathing propulsion there are three kinds one is solid rockets then the other is liquid rockets and lastly hybrid rockets the classification is done based on the physical state of the fuel and oxidizer remember in a non air breathing propulsion system you need to carry uh, the oxidizer on board right 
see so in this case the oxidizer carried on board okay so in this case fuel and oxidizer are solids and here fuel and oxidizer are liquids and in this case typically you will have fuel as solid and oxidizer as liquid okay now just to look at how these systems developed over a period of time remember we uh, started our discussions with firstly uh, fixed wing uh, design how uh, fixed wing design came about and how it took us 100 years after that to uh, develop the first flight so similarly let's look at how these things have evolved over a period of time now uh, most of you must have played with this diwali rockets right these diwali rockets use something known as uh, gunpowder or saltpeter now this was discovered by the chinese around the 11th or the 12th century so Uh, a typical composition of this is it has uh, potassium nitrate around 75 percent then sulfur fifteen percent and lastly charcoal. Ten percent. Okay, this is a typical composition of a uh, gunpowder, and this was discovered in the 11th and 12th century. After that, uh, they have been used as explosives, but their first use or first uh, known military use, as so as to speak, uh, as rockets, was somewhere in the uh, 1700s. by Tipu Sultan of Mysore state uh, he used this against the British in the third war between the British and the Tipu Sultan so these were uh, you know he had uh, fairly decent systems uh, but one of them was something like 2 meters long and weighed about 3.5 kgs and had a range of something like 3 kilometers okay he had another system which was of a shorter range of uh, 2 kgs and One point five meter and 
2 kilometer range. So, he had essentially two systems. If you look at uh, what these things did, uh, these were glorified current day rockets, right. Uh, but if you look back at a time when these were not known to people, okay, and suddenly you have something firing and coming at you, uh, you would be very, very scared. And this would this would be typically used to break up the cavalry ranks. If the enemy is approaching you in a, a rank formation and if you want to break it up and make them go helter skelter, uh, that is when you fire these things at them and that makes them really scared and more on. These were not really killing machines as such. Okay. Now, after the British uh, won the uh, final war of uh, Mysore around 1799, uh, they actually took all these things to Britain and there was a person by name William Congrave. He developed these systems further. He made a systematic study of them and developed this further and they were used in a few other wars fought by the British somewhere in Europe, but uh, never really took off beyond that. And uh, unfortunately, we do not have any of these specimens that uh, Tipu Sultan built anywhere in India now, they are only available in the British Museum in Britain. Okay. But uh, after the development uh, by William Congreve, it never really took off as a large system. Okay. They were used in a battles essentially to uh, break the ranks of the cavalry and things like that. And uh, they were later on discarded because liquid rockets became more prominent. Okay. As the 19th century arrived or the 20th century arrived, uh, liquid rockets became more prominent and uh, one would find that liquid rockets uh, began to be developed and talked about uh, in the 20th century uh, and the solid rockets made only a comeback after the second world war somewhere in the 1950s as large systems. Otherwise, they were relegated to the use of uh, being used as flares in ships right? or uh, they were used as uh, used for jet assisted takeoff. That is, if you have an aircraft that needs to take off within a short runway length, typically in a battle uh, operations, uh, the enemy will first come and try to bomb your airfields, so that your aircraft cannot take off. So, then your operational length of the airfield somehow becomes smaller and if you want to take off within that small length, then you need an extra thrust that probably the afterburner uh, might not also be able to provide. In such cases, you use the solid rockets and you can drop them as soon as you take off you can drop them. So, the you do not need to carry them. So, they were essentially used for uh, flares on ships or jet assisted takeoff. Okay. And only in the 1950s, they started getting developed into large systems. Okay. Now, let us look at what this solid rocket looks like.
have an igniter this is known as the head end and this is known as the nozzle end and you have a convergent divergent nozzle here okay this is the solid propellant and uh, this is known as port okay and you have a layer of inhibitor here okay. and this layer here is the insulation and this is the motor casing. So, this is a schematic of a okay. It has an igniter a propellant grain that is the solid propellant grain and it has a port wherein the uh, propellant burns and the gases fill up this place and it has a convergent divergent nozzle and the whole thing is cased inside a motor casing typically made of uh, uh, steel right or uh, other material uh, metals off late people are planning uh, are trying to use uh, FRPs or fiber reinforced plastics here just to save weight and uh, you have a layer of insulation here. What does an insulation do? Insulation prevents heat from being transferred or inhibits transfer of heat. Now there is something uh, known as inhibitor. Now what this inhibitor does is although there are high temperature gases here all through this it prevents the burning from taking place in this direction okay. It does not allow burning to take place in that direction that is the role of a inhibitor and typically silicon oxides are used as inhibitors and uh, the igniter is typically a solid propellant itself with a slightly higher loading of metal. We will discuss that when we discuss about solid propellants in a little more detail as we go along and you have a heat sensitive material here as soon as you apply some voltage across the two terminals this catches fire and as this burns the hot gases and metals fall on the propellant and the propellant gets ignited. Remember a solid propellant has both fuel and oxidizer.
okay. So this catches fire as soon as this starts to burn the pressure inside the chamber keeps on increasing okay because you only have one port and all the gases need to go out through that port and the pressure will keep on rising till the outflow and the inflow matches okay and that pressure is known as equilibrium pressure. that is if you take a pressure versus time graph the pressure keeps on rising and shoots beyond the equilibrium pressure and comes back to this pressure is known as equilibrium pressure it pressure increases and increases beyond the equilibrium pressure and comes back to this value okay. So then this high pressure high temperature gases okay that are formed here typically the pressures can be of the range of uh, 30 to 120 bar in the combustion chamber here and uh, temperatures can be in the range of 2600 to 3600 Kelvin. So this high temperature high pressure gases are then expanded through a convergent diversion nozzle. Why are we using a convergent diversion nozzle here? Why not a convergent nozzle? Because if you look at it the pressure upstream of it is very large and you have a large pressure ratio between the ambient and the pressure here. So you can expand it through a convergent divergent nozzle and that is why we use a convergent divergent nozzle in any of the rocket motors okay. So if you look at a TS diagram for this how will it look like if you were to sketch a TS diagram for the processes in it will there is combustion at high pressure and there is expansion through the right uh, through the nozzle it is a self pressurized system because of burning the system pressurizes itself it does not need any compressor and the high pressure high temperature gases expand through the nozzle thus producing the required moment okay. Now let us look at how to derive the thrust equation for this okay. remember we derived the thrust equation for a air breathing system let us do the same for this non air breathing system. I will take the entire rocket motor as a box and it has only one exit it does not have any inlet because it does not need to uh, take in air. So it has only one exit and let me call the conditions here as rho e or let me call the mass flow rate that is coming out as m, m dot and pressure as p e and area as AE okay fine and the ambient pressure is okay. Now with this you will you will find that 
if we were to find the sum of the forces in the x direction that is the negative x direction there is thrust acting in this direction okay thrust must be equal to force must be equal to rate of change of right I did not uh, put one more quantity that is the exhaust velocity V e okay. Now force must be equal to rate of change of momentum right what is the rate of change of momentum here firstly let us look at what is the forces F minus A e P e minus P a right there is a pressure differential across this P e minus P a and this area is A e. So this is acting in the opposite direction as F so I have taken the minus sign must be equal to what is rate of change of momentum here m dot into V e because there is no intake at all right. So you have therefore F is equal to this is the thrust equation for a rocket motor it does not matter what kind of rocket motor you have liquid or solid or hybrid this is the thrust equation okay. Now if you remember uh, we had uh, defined a quantity called specific fuel consumption right when we talked about uh, gas turbine engines or turbojet engines and turbofan engines. Similarly, we can define a quantity called uh, specific impulse here. Okay. What is impulse? Impulse is force into time, right? So specific impulse is force into time divided by mass. Okay. So if you look at the expression, it is F by m dot. That is. There is nothing but force per unit mass flow rate. Okay. And the units of this is Newton second per kg. This is uh, the uh, ISP and SFC is ISP is nothing but 1 by SFC if you remember SFC was nothing but mass flow rate per unit thrust mass flow rate of fuel per unit thrust in this case it is the combined mass flow rate of fuel plus oxidizer this includes mass flow rate of fuel plus mass flow rate of oxidizer whereas SFC is nothing but m dot f by f okay now a couple of classes back you had asked me uh, how is it that you can say that you get optimal thrust when pe is equal to pa 
you had uh, asked me how that is optimal. Now, let us take the case when P e is equal to P a. What happens then? The flow is said to be optimally expanded. If you look at this uh, convergent divergent nozzle, or I will draw a different sketch here. Now, uh, just like probably some of you are aware of this in aerodynamics, you get the lift on the airfoil by integrating all the pressure over the aerofoil. Okay. Similarly, you can get the thrust produced by a rocket motor by integrating the pressure acting on the uh, surface of the rocket motor. So, if you take a look at this, the pressure acting on this direction in this direction cancels each other out because of symmetry. So, we are only interested in pressure acting in this direction. So, you will have pressure acting on this surface and then after the nozzle. Okay. What do we mean by optimally expanded when ambient pressure is equal to exit pressure? So, pressure here is I will draw only the uh, top half, it is symmetric about it. Pressure goes on decreasing as you go from the convergent portion to the exit, right. Pressure in decreases and velocity increases. And let me take it that at the exit it is equal to the ambient pressure. Okay. The ambient pressure is a constant, right. Now, this is the nozzle when it is optimally expanded. What happens when uh, P e is greater than P a and what happens when P e is less than P a is what we need to look at. If we are able to show that in both these cases it is less than the thrust produced by this case when P e equal to P a we have proved our point. Okay. Now, let us take a look at uh, when P e is greater than P a, how does that happen? If I cut off a portion of the nozzle here, right. If I were to cut off a portion of the nozzle, remove a portion of the nozzle, then the pressure here is greater than the ambient pressure, right. But what have I done? I have cut off a portion. If you look at this, the pressure on the inside is greater than the pressure on the outside. So, there is a net force in this direction which you can resolve in these two perpendicular directions. Now, this force cancels each other out because of symmetry and you get only this, right. So, if I removed a portion here in order to make P e greater than P a, I am taking out essentially a portion that was producing thrust, 
which means the thrust is going to be smaller than what it was when P e equal to P a. Now, let us consider the other case when P e is less than P a. Now, if you see this, the ambient pressure is constant, but the pressure inside is decreasing below the ambient pressure. When that happens, which side is the net force acting on? If you look at the rest of the portion up to this point, this is the point where P e is equal to P a, right. Up to this portion, the net force was acting in this direction. Now, the pressure on the inside surface is less than the pressure on the outside surface. So, the net force will be acting in this direction which if you resolve will give rise to forces in these two directions perpendicular directions. Now, this is producing a negative thrust right. So, if we add a portion of the nozzle so that P e is less than P a we are adding a portion which will produce negative thrust and therefore, it will be not the highest. So, the maximum thrust that you can get is when P e is equal to P a. If you look at it the other way around, one can argue that if P e keeps on decreasing is when the velocities will keep on increasing okay and therefore, if P e decreases and goes to 0 is when velocities will reach a maximum okay. Now, let us look at what are the yes. Uh, like if we in the in the process if we cut that nozzle like we have a super uh, conventional diversion nozzle and rocket is flying suppose we cut that nozzle and only the conversion part is there mm -hmm. so it will produce negative thrust no. because no you are forgetting something here there is a thrust acting here no this surface or say this surface you can yes you are right the pressure here is acting in a in this direction fine, but this area is there is a small area wherein it is acting in this direction right. This this direction will be greater than what is on this direction. Most of the thrust come in the rocket most of the thrust come from the front part if you integrate the pressures yes, if you integrate the pressures that is. If you cut off the nozzle here yes the conversion portion if you look at it from that perspective is producing only a negative thrust and a component of it is what you are looking at, but there is a throat right and there is a portion in this direction and remember always the throat pressure is much less than the chamber pressure. So, therefore, you will get a positive thrust even if you have just a conversion nozzle okay now having looked at uh, how to get the thrust and what is isp let's look at what are all the different kinds of uh, solid propellant uh, that are available to us or that are currently being used There are three kinds of solid propellants. The first is homogeneous or 
double base and lastly composite modified double base. Now if you look at solid propellants there is a problem with regards to solid propellant. The fuel and oxidizer need to be in close proximity with each other and yet not react okay, over a period of time. So that is that restricts us from using any solid fuel and oxidizer because they have to be compatible right they should not react with each other and in addition they should have good mechanical properties so that they can be used in uh, large rocket motors. So uh, homogeneous propellant or double base propellant in this the fuel and oxidizer are mixed at a molecular level that is even if you take a small portion of it you would not be able to make out which is fuel which is oxidizer if you take a double base propellant. The typical fuels and oxidizers are uh, fuel less nitrocellulose and oxidizer is nitroglycerin they are used nearly in the same proportion and that is why the name double base two bases is what it indicates. Now different as different from this in a composite propellant fuel and oxidizer are mechanically mixed that is if you take a small portion of the propellant you will be able to identify what is a fuel and what is a oxidizer and uh, typical fuels are uh, HTPB or hydroxy terminated polybutadiene and oxidizer is ammonium perchlorate and we also add aluminum in these propellants which is essentially a fuel. We will discuss this in a great detail a little later in the course. Now uh, the essential difference between these two propellants is because this needs to be mixed at a molecular level there is a stronger restriction on this and therefore uh, the specific impulse that we uh, discussed a little earlier is low for if I were to ISP for double base is lower than ISP for composite propellants because in this case you can mechanically mix them there is a lesser restriction and therefore you can find suitable chemicals that you can mix and get a slightly higher performance. Typically the uh, performance of this is this is around you get an ISP of around 2000 new, 2300 Newton seconds per kg 
and this can go up to 2500 Newton second per kg. Why then are these one would have thought that because this is superior in terms of performance we should not be using this at all. Why do we have both of them still surviving? One of the reasons is if you look at uh, in a military application essentially uh, what happens is if you take a composite propellant the composite propellant has aluminum if you see here and this aluminum oxide uh, produces a strong thermal signature and in addition the ammonium perchlorate that we are using has as the, in the exhaust products uh, HCl which reacts with water in the atmosphere and also gives a strong exhaust signature. If you are looking at a short range missile right or a tactical missile as it is called battlefield missile you would not want the enemy to know from where you have fired it right because then the enemy can come back and hit you. So which is why you would not want to use these propellants for short range missiles or tactical missiles. So, for short range or tactical missiles you end up using double base propellant. because this does not have such a heat signature and uh, a composite modified double base propellant is simply you add HMX or RDX to double base propellant that gives you composite modified double base propellant that will also not have a, a heat signature but will have a higher performance and therefore it will give you a better performance but uh, it will not have a strong signature like composite propellants and sometimes people use ammonium perchlorate also in this okay in the composite modified double base propellant. The typical uses of heterogeneous propellant are for long range missiles and launch vehicles. Long range missiles you do not care about what happens whether the enemy detects you because you are uh, separated by a large distance from the target. Now if you look at this table here I have put together uh, thrust different kinds of propellants and ISP here. You look at uh, the last few ones they are very large motors that produce very large thrust this has 139 tons of propellant the PSLV stage 1 and produces something like uh, 4.5 mega newtons of thrust okay. And you look at ISPs it is of the uh, the first ones are uh, the first two are double base propellants it is around 210 uh, 2100. Uh, Newton second per kg and it can go up to something like 2500 for a composite propellant okay. We will stop here and continue in the next class where we will discuss about liquid propellant rockets, thank you.